Uh, good evening. Uh, b welcome back. Some of you understand probably had attended the original uh, uh, date, which was, was this was supposed to be presented back in June or July, I can't recall. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, I was laid up in bed with a, my back out of place. But today, I'm standing upright, and I'm happy to be here uh, to talk with you guys about uh, the large-scale impacts of drought, specifically, though, on uh, impacts in wildlife habitat. Um, that's what I do. I'm a wildlife biologist. I work for the city. I manage our open space and habitat areas, uh, look after a lot of our local wildlife species, and kind of monitor um, monitor some of the local impacts of drought. I think more of what I'm monitoring these days is the direct impact and conflict between wildlife and uh, Davis residents, the human residents, um, specifically because we have noticed during this drought that there's more uh, activity, a little more conflict close to home because the drought is affecting the wildlife in the sense that they're not able to find uh, those water resources that ultimately or, or in, in wetter years would be available to them. So, you know, damaging sprinklers to get after that water or simply coming into the house, burrowing under the houses to find cooler, uh, moist places to, to uh, not hibernate per se, but to roost or, or loaf. Um, so anyway, that's what I do, that's who I am. And I'm gonna try to figure out Paige. Happy to be here. Okay, so my name's John McNary. No, just kidding. <laughs> Let's hope we got this going. Push it there, push it there, push it here. Amen, Put it down, go the old fashioned way. Okay, so this is what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, uh, what I wanted to start off with a little bit is uh, basically how bad is the current drought? You know, where we've seen it, we're experiencing it, we're being asked to conserve water, that's important. But why, um, and, and really what are we looking at as far as statewide drought, you know, Western statewide drought? Um, how badly is this impacting the state's wildlife and its habitats? And then also what's being done to, to try to help wildlife out during these, these periods of drought? Um, so you, you may have heard that this is possibly the worst drought in, uh, in history, or at least on recorded history. Um, and so I put a question mark there because, you know, here in California, we've experienced droughts. We've experienced some pretty doozies in the past as well. Um, but there's some things about this particular drought that we're experiencing that are different and certainly cause for concern, perhaps to uh, eventually label it as, as the worst in California. Um, what you see here are some, uh, these are the, the drought, uh, severity maps that are put together by um, the uh, by NOAA, uh, the, the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And you can see the dates here. This is 2011 all the way down through today. And you can see the change. And these were all snapshots taken, I think, in the middle of the summer, about June or July, uh, showing the severity. So yellow is, that's, you know, it's dry. It, it, it's a, basically, it's starting to show signs of being dry. Uh, not as no, enough precipitation to essentially keep uh, the conditions uh, to be ir irrigate crops or have enough water to fill reservoirs. 2002, you can see it starts advancing a little bit up the state and a little wider, uh, maybe even a little more uh, severe in some areas. But 2013, we're now in a drought. Things are dry. We're not seeing the water. Uh, 2014, we're in severe drought. And that's where these red and this brick red color here, um, we just aren't seeing the, the, the precipitation or, and more importantly, the snowpack. Um, and then today it looks very much like last year, uh, perhaps with some more of that brick red color indicating severe drought conditions. Um, gonna talk a little bit about precipitation. You know, when you talk about a drought, you're looking at things like precipitation, uh, but generally it's the availability of that water for uses like agriculture, you know, consumption at home, um, but also wildlife and wildlife habitat. Um, this particular chart here shows, uh, as of today's date, this is northern Sierra precipitation amounts. So that's this shaded green area. Uh, sorry if I'm blocking you, um, but you can kind of see it. It includes essentially what our watershed is, the, the Sacramento uh, River watershed. Um, these lines, all these different colors here, uh, represent daily precipitation throughout the years. 
um, starting, it's, well, actually not throughout the years, but throughout the water year. So this is October 1st through September 30th is what they uh, uh, will call the, the um, uh, well, the, the, wa the water year, if you will. Um, the green line here is the wettest recorded rainfall. Um, that was between 1982 and 1983, um, or at least the 1982-83 rainfall year and the very driest is this red line down here and that was in 1923. Um, the second near driest 1976 that black line just below it um, it seemed to make a run right there at the end and get itself up to 19 um, uh, I believe those are entrance uh, average uh, interest or inches that have fallen to the ground. Now this whole blue section represents the average for all those years, uh, 1922 to 1998. I don't know why they don't include the recent years, but that is what they take that average on. Um, and you can see today we are, or at least this year, 2015, is this blue line. Um, and we're at about 36, uh, 36 point, almost 37 inches of rainfall, in, again, in this northern part of the state. Uh, this doesn't include, you know, these areas, so we're just kind of focused on our, our, uh, our regional watershed. Um, interesting to note that we are only about 75 or so percent of average, so that's pretty low. Um, is it horrible? No, not necessarily. I mean, it's 75 percent of average. We're within that range of being average. Uh, we're certainly not the driest. Um, you know, we're certainly looking better than 2013, 14, uh, which was uh, really the start of that, uh, well, just the following years before the drought really was uh, taking effect. Um, but the point of this graph is I just want to show you that precipitation has been okay. It hasn't been bone dry desert. We've been getting rain. Uh, we had a pretty decent uh, late winter into uh, spring. We had some pretty good rainfall. Uh, but when you look at the statewide average for this data, it actually does trend down slightly. Um, Southern California uh, uh, data was pretty, pretty dry, but right around in that uh, 50 to 75 percent of average. So not great, but again, not, not really horrible as far as rainfall goes. Now this one, it's a crazy graph. And what I'm gonna to try to quickly um, point out is this, this is snow water content. So this is equivalent to what the snowpack is doing up in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, that is California's reservoir, its largest reservoir in the snowfall. So this is um, the amount of water that is in that snow. So, so you can kind of consider it the volume of water that's sitting up there. So this blue line here is the wettest record. And oh, again, this is the northern section, central section, and southern section of the Sierra Nevada. So this is basically the uh, Trinity River area down to Truckee, uh, Yuba, Tahoe area, San Joaquin down uh, past Owens Valley down below. Um, this blue line represents the wettest on each one of these. And you can see the wettest was in 1982 to 83, uh, wet season. Uh, that was a significant amount of water came down. The average is this black line. Um, and then the driest is this red line. It goes right here. Um, and then where we're at right now is the current is this pink line. So you can see for all of these, pink line, look at pink line versus the driest year. Pink line versus driest year. Pink line versus driest year. Throughout the entire Sierra Nevada province, we are experiencing in, you know, the, the worst snow conditions in recorded history. Um, and that's been that way, I think, starting last year. Uh, last year was the green line. So you can see it was right about at the driest, more or less. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's pretty bleak. And, and that, that, that's actually probably the most important thing to look at when you talk about drought. Um, precipitation, we have reservoirs that can capture that, we can use it, um, but what we can't rely on it is to, you know, the, the consumption that we, we, you know, when we are consuming at a high rate, those summertime levels in those reservoirs will deplete to a point where, you know, uh oh, we're in trouble, what are we going to do? Well, 28% mandatory reductions. Um, 
but there's other important reasons why snowpack uh, uh, is there is because it continuously flows into creeks and streams and fills wetlands and other things, and these are all important habitats. They may not be overly important to us while it's running down the hill. We're more concerned about what's coming out of our tap, but to the wildlife uh, out running around those hills, that's very important to them. Um, so they're not, those rivers and creeks are drying up, so that habitat is disappearing. Uh, here again, just to reinforce uh, what it looks like, it's kind of hard to see, but this is, uh, these are Landsat images. Uh, this is in 2011, 2000, um, 2012, and 2014, I think that was last year. Uh, but you can see this is Lake Tahoe. Uh, this is the crest of the Sierra Nevada right in that center section. Here it was, you know, lots of great snow. Oh, and by the way, this is in February, so the peak of winter. Um, uh, probably at the peak of snowfall. And you can see, you know, not bad. There's quite a bit of snow there. The following picture shows, yeah, same time, following year, not so great. And then uh, last year, very little snow. Um, it'll be interesting to see this winter um, if El Nino improves that. Maybe, maybe not. Could, could uh, actually make it worse. So we need to kind of be optimistic or uh, cautiously optimistic there. So I talked a little bit about reservoirs. Again, a very busy graph, so I don't expect you guys to you know, capture all this. Um, what I do think is pretty interesting to note, though, is um, so some of our local uh, reservoirs, like Lake Berryessa, for example, is this little tiny blue thing on the bottom here. And this is all volume. This is how storage capacity in there. Um, so we're the, that tiny little blue thing down here versus Lake Mead. Uh, on the Colorado River. I mean, that's substantial. You can think there's a lot of water out there. Um, and then, you know, 128 other uh, reservoirs throughout California. So there's, there's quite a few of them. Um, this black line here is a trend line in population. So millions of people in the state of California. Um, and this line represents demand or uh, pressures on this reservoir system. Um, interesting th points uh, or things to, to look at is these dips right here, or those are the scary things. <laughs> those are the things where it's like, oh, wow, that water is going way down very quickly. You know, within a couple year period, it's not recovering. And that's the important part is its ability to recover back up close to capacity. Um, and these dips actually coincide with drought years in the state of California. So this was the drought, I think, of like 19... 70 or six somewhere around in there when it started um, and you can see several years of drought and then we had a really wet year brought us back up and so on and so forth another drought year a couple of drought years right in around here I think another here here and then this is where we're at at the far end down here and you can see we're in a drought you know those reservoirs are being depleted uh, which is pretty obvious if you go and take a look at them this time of year um, so yeah, reservoirs, uh, very helpful, but not a solution to um, our water needs by any means. Um, <coughs> droughts happen, and I mentioned this before, state of California, uh, even Oregon, Nevada, you know, we're the arid west of, of, the, uh, of North America. Um, we're used to seeing dry conditions. Uh, most of the animals, most of the plants and habitat, the natural things here, have existed in these kind of wet, you know, boom and dry cycles. Um, this just shows you uh, kind of a list of re recorded droughts in the state of California. Um, it gives you the duration of that and years of that particular drought. So it started in 1918, for example, it went three years. Um, and then uh, the, the, the other, uh, the last column there is, the uh, interval between the end of the drought and the start of that next drought. Um, so you can see throughout here, we've had a couple of long ones, you know, eight years, that's a long time to be in a drought. You imagine maybe we're in that particular cycle right now. Even in 86, we had a six year drought um, period, which was rough. Um, you know, there's been some space between drought cycles, 13, 11 years, um, but on average, we have about a four year drought cycle and we look at about seven years or so uh, in between those, those drought cycles. Um, here's 2012 data, that's kind of the start of this drought we're in. Um, 
and so far we're in year four of it, and hopefully it will uh, it'll break, but we, there's no guarantees at this point. Um, but it's interesting to see too that, you know, every four years, uh, every seven, uh, I'm sorry, four, four years long, every seven, six or seven years, it seems like on average, we're just swinging from one drought to the next drought to the next drought. And that's, you know, maybe that's the natural way of things here. The, that's a st obviously the plants and the animals here have adapted to be able to sustain some of these droughts in a natural cycle. But we're certainly seeing some differences like the snowpack, for example. Um, yeah, and this kind of illustrates that. So, yeah, I mean, they happen, but we're experiencing those high temperatures. We have record high temperatures. Um, this chart here is average, California average temperature January through June. Um, and these are the years, uh, I believe, down yeah, back, back here in 1900s all the way through uh, 2000. I believe this is to date, so 2015. Um, actually, it may be less than that now that I'm looking at it. But anyway, you can see that trend. This is uh, the average temperature on incline. So we're seeing, seeing the temperatures rise and rise and rise. And we've seen some of the hottest on record recently. Um, this is precipitation. So again, this is looking statewide. Uh, looking at all precipitation, and you can see it's you know, roughly trending about average, but there's a slight decrease. You might not be able to make that out. But you can see down here, we're in one of the very low uh, uh, precipitation cycles for the entire state. Um, you know, reason, reason for, uh, for concern there. Uh, record low snowpack, so I think, is ultimately, for wildlife, going to be one of the biggest issues uh, as far as sustaining them and, and allowing them to, to uh, uh, not fade away uh, and become extinct. So there are some populations that are at risk because of this drought, current, this current drought. Um, and we'll talk some more about those later. So let's talk more about... Uh, the impacts on wildlife and habitats. Um, there's basically, and I'm gonna, this, this is, I'm gonna generalize some of this information just because it can get very deep and we could spend, you know, hours and hours talking about this. So I wanna give you guys the main kind of take home issues here. Um, drought obviously can reduce the availability of habitat. Um, certainly the suitability of those habitats for wildlife. It increases stress and disease, and, and inter, or, uh, uh, increases the disease in, in wildlife populations. Um, and ultimately, those contribute to decre decreasing population levels. Um, this little uh, diagram down here is just basic 101 trophic scale uh, uh, life cycle, if you will. So you have uh, producers, primary producers, that's the food everybody else eats. That's typically grass, but it could be also be looked at shrubs, trees, other vegetation. Um, and the inputs for those, those, the basic needs for plants are the sun, the carbon dioxide, and the water. Um, everything else on the way up eats that. Primary, secondary, tertiary consumers. Once you're at the top or anywhere in between here, you die. Decomposers break you down and you start that cycle again, um, which is important because that's the fourth input nutrient. Um, but water, you start taking some of these things out of there and the whole system starts to wobble a little bit. It doesn't do quite as well. Not as much is produced. That means there's not enough food for these guys, which equals no, you know, not enough food for those guys and so on and so forth. So it can cause destabilization in that entire thing. It's also important to note that all of the higher predators in, in the ecosystem are also needing water in their diet. Um, some don't, like owls, for example, don't drink water. They won't go to an open source of water. They don't need a pond of water. Um, but they do need water in their lives, and they acquire it by eating these guys. So it's important that they're getting water so that they're around, can be eaten, and, and keep water moving through that system. So habitat reduction uh, is it's really it's becoming visible. If you start driving up around uh, the Sierras, you start looking at some of the creeks and streams nearby, and certainly some of the lower valley wetlands. Um, and I'd mentioned before, we have less and lower quality uh, cover 
So wildlife need cover. That's one of the important elements, water, food, and cover. Um, primarily, we're seeing it in aquatic systems, um, but terrestrial systems can be impacted as well. For example, in this forest scene here, you can see some drought stressing of trees. Um, it could be secondary infection with beetles, but the point is um, you will start to see decline in these ecosystems from the top down, um, and that will cause uh, uh, you know, big changes in the availability of food, uh, so it lowers food production, and it will also cause wildlife in those systems to concentrate, which will uh, also cause a lot of problems, which we'll, we'll talk about here in a bit. Um, you know, down here, a river system, you can see the water as it recedes, uh, goes into little shallow pools like this, and that uh, is not very good cover for fish, for example, that might need to migrate and breed in that creek. Um, you know, this might look like a nice breeding site, nice gravel bed, could host salmon, uh, but at this point it's not hosting anybody because there's no water there. Uh, valley wetlands, for example, here, nice wetland scene, lots of waterfowl in there. Uh, you can see the ordinary high water mark uh, about this, uh, this line, and that's dropping, and as it's dropping, it's constricting, so all those waterfowl are in a smaller and smaller pond as that water goes down. Um, you know, again, competing for, well, maybe not again, but we'll talk about that causes complications um, when they get into tighter quarters like that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the most, uh, what we're seeing now, the greatest impact is on the aquatic systems. Um, and these include uh, the more sensitive, smaller ones like fresh emergent wetlands, ponds, creeks, and springs and bogs. These are directly related to water. These need that rainfall. They need the groundwater, for example, uh, if you're looking at springs and bogs. Um, and uh, they're, they're, some of them are tiny and some of them are isolated. Uh, the, as they dry up, there's a whole little uh, microcosm of animals that are specializing on that pond that are at risk of disappearing if those disappear. Uh, coastal estuaries are another one. You wouldn't think, hey, you know, why a coastal estuary, how is that being impacted by drought conditions? Well, there's this fine balance there. It's the balance between salt water and fresh water. And so you get this estuary, which are typically brackish systems where you have salty fresh water or you know, freshened salt water, depending on which way the tide is pushing or pulling, or depending on how much water is flowing down through that, that water, uh, riverine system at that time. Um, but what we're seeing now is salt water moving further up because there's less fresh water coming down. And that can change the whole ecosystem there as well. Now you have freshwater specialists that are higher up the reach that are sitting in salt water. So this could be emergent you know, cattails or bulrush. They don't like that salt. They start to die off. That cover, that forage, those habitats starts to disappear. So you get these large areas of, of coastal estuary that start disappearing. Uh, and then lakes and rivers. Uh, obviously there is just dropping water levels and warming water, that's important, especially now. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about that as a, as a direct impact that uh, Fish and Wildlife Agencies are dealing with in the state of California, quite literally at this moment. Um, one thing I wanted to point out way down here at the bottom, if you can see it, is that uh, there's another special wetland habitat that we have here in the Central Valley, a vernal pool. So these are seasonally filled pools. Um, interestingly, those systems are designed to sustain drought. Um, maybe that's because they dry out annually. They fill up in the wintertime, but then they dry out. So there's a whole group of specialized species that live in those vernal pools, but all of them have uh, adaptive, adapted strategies within their life history to sustain those periods of dry. In fact, uh, there's a little crustacean, a fairy shrimp, a, a vernal pool fairy shrimp, um, whose eggs are more or less cysts, and they will lay in that soil for years and years and years and years until water hits them again, and then they'll pop open and start over again. So they, these are, uh, are truly drought specialists, and so there is some hope that those very fragile systems, uh, if we can preserve them, will sustain through uh, whatever you know, climate change and is coming our way. <coughs> Pardon me. 
so I'd mentioned stress and disease uh, earlier, and this is largely a uh, artifact of, of things like, like just spending, the animal has to spend more time to go out and find food. That food is disappearing. Those plants that it may have relied on are not there anymore. The seeds or the grass uh, that it needs to, to, to eat is no longer there. Could be the water is dried up. Now there's no fish for them to eat anymore. Um, so they have to spend more time to gather less. Uh, and that is, you know, their, their energy balance goes way out of whack. They have to burn a lot of energy to get very little. And so their physiological changes that occur, they starve, they're slowly starving. And when that happens, now they're open to all kinds of different things, including uh, disease transmission. Their systems are more susceptible to, to uh, a parasite invasion. Um, but also intraspecific and interspecific competition. And this is uh, intraspecific would be, uh, you know, competition within those species for the same food resources. Now I only have a small amount of food. We're gonna fight over that and only one of us is gonna make it. Uh, and, and then the interspecific is competing with all the other uh, species that are trying to use that same habitat. So it can be very uh, problematic. Um, oh, and I'd mentioned susceptibility to disease, but also transmission rate goes up. So disease, that contact with other animals increases. So there's greater transfer of those uh, diseases. Just if you're curious, these pictures here, this is uh, botulism um, and some uh, grebes. They almost look like they could be murs on the coast, but that's strange because it's inland. Um, but anyway, it's uh, botulism. And botulism is naturally occurring toxin that's in the environment, but it uh, begins to bloom and manifest when water levels get low get warm and oxygen levels start to plummet. Um, birds are attracted to water. The botulism is, is elevated levels in that. So when they eat it, uh, they become sickened and then it can spread like wildfire and kill off hundreds, if not thousands of, of birds in a particular period of time while it's blooming. Um, we are starting to see indicators that that's in the last two years that that's becoming uh, more of an issue with waterfowl, especially in the wetlands nearby. Uh, this poor little coyote down here, if you could tell, that was a coyote pup. Um, he's suffering from uh, sarcoptic mange, and mange is definitely, in the, especially in the canid family, a primary indicator of stress. So if you know this animal's not getting enough food, um, they, will, they will get that mange and it will spread through their body and make them look pretty bad. Um, generally, without intervention, it will eventually, this, this particular animal will, will Will succumb to um, the, the, that mange. It will just sap its resources, and it's a slow, unfortunate death for that animal. Um, and ultimately, these things lead to population decline. Um, using well, uh, so so basically, when you look at population, a healthy population, you have uh, you know, a lot of reproduction going on and there's a lot of healthy adults that are doing it. So that then produces offspring, offspring make it, plenty of resources, everybody's happy. But in drought, when you start pulling out that food and you start pulling out that cover and you start introducing higher uh, rates of disease, uh, that mortality goes way up and the breeding adults goes way down. So the actual reproductive uh, success goes way down. Um, the example here, I'm using coho salmon, um, and you know these are maybe one of the poster ch uh, children, if you will, poster fish, <laughs> um, poster fries, maybe that's the appropriate term, um, for the drought right now is that we're, uh, you know, they've been under stress for a long time, uh, just you know, human caused changes to the landscape and to watershed water quality has caused uh, the coho in our local creeks and streams uh, to plummet. You know, this was in 1820 doing fish counts of number of returning coho salmon. These are the, you know, when the coho hatch out, they swim down the creek out to the ocean. They spend a couple of years out there and then they swim back up to breed. And this is what they're looking for is a return of those breeders. So back in 1820, there was a lot of them. 
And then you can see it starts crashing down, um, heading towards 2020, and it looks like that line by 2020, there may be no more coming back up. And at that point, your population is done. Um, what we are seeing now is the, the pretty important sp uh, spring and summer runs uh, that will come up. So those are the young that were hatched out uh, several years ago coming back up. They're seeing very few of them. Um, and when they are getting up here, they're finding warm water or no water at all. So there's, there's no breeding habitat. Talk about a recipe for disaster in a wildlife population. That is what's happening now. There's some fish rescuing going on. I know the Stanis, or, uh, down in San Joaquin River, the, the hatcheries down there, there's an emergency effort to, to pick fish up and go hold them in the higher elevation pond, uh, lakes until waters return and then you know, they're gonna try to bring them back down again. Uh, but they're spending a lot of time and effort to do that. And it's not always the best. Uh, I mean, we talked about stress, right? I mean, when you are interfering with these fish, you're increasing stress on them and mortality can go up just by that intervention. But the alternative is 100% kill. He might be able to save 75% of them if you're lucky. So anyway, um, the Nimbus fish hatchery, has anybody been over there to visit that? Um, there's some pretty interesting things. Um, well, uh, things that they're doing out there uh, in response to the fish, because the water is so warm, the, the breeding habitat is, is compromised. They're actually install, spending you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to install water chillers. That's where we're at right now, is we're having to cool the water down to support nature. Um, so there's some challenges ahead for sure. Um, some of the hardest hit species so far that, uh, that we're seeing with this particular drought, uh, again, coho had mentioned that, but also its, um, its relatives, chinook and steelhead salmon, uh, very similar behavior where they will rush out to the ocean, spend some time and then come up here. Um, and their habitat is creeks and rivers, obviously. Um, giant garter snake, that's a um, garter snake that's just here in the Central Valley. Its populations have been in decline over the last many years um, just because of uh, habitat conversion to agriculture or uh, you know f for houses human human uses um, but they have learned to use some of those agricultural areas like the irrigation ditches and drainage ditches um, so they've made a bit of recovery just based on that um, but because now we're having to struggle to find water to irrigate that, the, uh, those crops, especially the farmers, there's not as much irrigation going on or they're switching to dry crops. So this would be like winter wheat or safflower or something that doesn't require irrigation. Lots of acres of that being not irrigated anymore. Lots of these snakes being forced to go into subsuitable habitats. So there's some real concern that they're already kind of fragile that they're going to be dipping back down towards extinction again. Uh, last example here, which is uh, kind of interesting because it's already in a very arid desert ecosystem down in the southern deserts of California. It's the uh, Amargosa vole. Um, this is just like our, the voles we have up here that live in the grass, but these are uh, riparian, desert riparian specialists. And this is, believe it or not, a seep. Uh, or a spring out in the desert. There's some nice lush green vegetation growing around it. And these guys, they spend their entire life right in these green patches, you know, maybe outside a little bit, but it gets pretty inhospitable as they, they creep around uh, past that. Now the problem here is groundwater extraction in these basins is causing these water levels to drop. And when those water levels drop, so does the water, <laughs> essentially. These roots can't go any deeper. This vegetation begins to die off. Their habitat disappears within a couple of years. That's what we're seeing. So there's some effort to study them, to learn more about what their needs are, and to try to replicate those needs um, so that their population doesn't disappear, or their species doesn't disappear.